The opportunistic mycoses are fungal infections that are mostly only going to make people sick if they are otherwise compromised, just like with our opportunistic bacterial infections. I won't go over this table in a lot of detail because you can read it at your convenience, but as you might imagine, there are lots of different things that can make a patient susceptible to an opportunistic fungal infection. And so you can read them here, um, why it makes them susceptible and what are some of the major fungal infections these patients might get. The first group of opportunistic fungi that we'll talk about are belong to the genus Candida or Candidiasis is the fungal infection that results from um, Candida. So there are a number of different species that are associated with causing opportunistic infections. And in fact, uh, for patients who have um, a central line uh, that when they're in the hospital, candida bloodstream infections are actually the third most common cause of bloodstream infections behind enterococcus species um, and some of our coagulase negative staphylococcal species like staph epidermidis. The majority of candida species are seen as oval shaped yeast. However, they can um, produce hyphae uh, and pseudo hyphae, except for one particular species can't produce those, but the rest of them can. And we call this phenotype switching. They can switch from a hyphal form, which is almost like the mold like form to the yeast form. And that may be part of what allows candida to be very successful in colonizing lots of different parts of the host. Most candida infections are endogenous. So we spent a lot of time talking about bacteria that normally live on and in the human body. Well, candida is a genus of fungi that typically lives on and in the human body. So we do have a mycobiome of fungi that are associated with us. So the majority of patients who develop candida infections do so because their own fungus made them sick. However, some patients can develop exogenous infections, and we tend to see that most frequently as hospital-acquired infections. So this is a case of recurrent fungemia, instead of bacteremia, it's fungemia, in a 35-year-old woman. The patient was seen at five weeks gestation after intrauterine insemination. So Intrauterine insemination is a fertility treatment where the sperm are washed and directly inserted into the uterus. Um, this can be helpful um, for uh, patients who are you know, single mothers, um, lesbian couples, women whose partners have uh, sperm motility issues, women whose partners don't produce sperm. Lots of reasons somebody might do uh, intrauterine insemination. So at five weeks gestation, so not far along in the pregnancy, she had a fever, um, elevated heart rate, low blood pressure, white blood cell count was high, um, and she had a miscarriage. Spontaneous abortion is the scientific term for a miscarriage. Uh, so she had severe chorioamnitis. That basically means um, that she had an infection in the placenta and the amniotic um, sac. Placental and fetal tissues were cultured. Blood culture and vaginal swabs were obtained. The patient was treated with a broad spectrum antibacterial. Five days later, no clinical improvement was seen. The culture and placental samples actually grew a species of candida which was also isolated from the patient's vaginal cultures. So uh, the fungus was tested for its resistance to fluconazole. The organism was not resistant, so the patient was prescribed fluconazole. By four weeks later, she had a complete resolution of her symptoms with the eradication of the fungus from her bloodstream. Antifungal treatment was discontinued. Patient was sent home. Six months later, readmitted. Fever, chills, fatigue elevated white blood cell count, 
Blood cultures were again positive for that same species of Canada, which was found in cultures of her vaginal fluid. All isolates were found to be resistant to fluconazole. So now she's developed fluconazole resistant Canada. On the basis of these findings, the patient was treated with amphotericin B. Within one week, her clinical condition improved. After one month, her blood cultures were sterile and she was discharged again. Three years later, she remained free of evidence from infection. This is an unusual case in that the patient was not immune compromised, yet experienced recurrent candidemia with candida glabrata. The use of fluconazole as an initial therapy, although apparently successful, induced an upregulation of drug efflux pumps in the organism and allowed later isolates to become resistant to fluconazole and other azoles. So the question with this patient would be, you know, where did the infection come from? Uh, my hypothesis would be that the candida glabrata is a normal resident of the vaginal community. So it's part of just the normal organisms that are there. And during the intrauterine insemination, it is very likely that the fungus was introduced into the uterus. And so when the patient became pregnant from the intrauterine insemination, there was already the fungus growing in the uterus where it shouldn't have been, and that's probably what caused the issue. But what do I know? I'm just a medical microbiologist. We do tend to see um, candida albicans as the candida organism that causes the most infections, but there are some others listed here. Um, again, different isolates. Candida albicans tends to be the most common in all parts of the world. A um, couple of other species relatively similar in terms of how common they are. And the other thing that we see here is what we call um, attributable mortality. So these opportunistic infections, again, tend to make people or tend to infect people only when those patients are already in some way compromised. But what we tend to see is that when those patients develop the fungal infection, they also can die from it. And so we call that attributable mortality. Basically, the patient died because of the fungal infection, not because of whatever else made them sick. And so um, what you're looking at is percent mortality and this is basically saying that 38% uh, of patients who got a candida albicans or candida whatever infection on top of what else was making them sick, 38% of them died because of that infection. They would have survived otherwise. And that number jumped up to 49% by 2001. So about half of patients who got a candida infection and died died because of the candida infection. They did not die from their underlying condition. With another opportunistic fungus that we're going to talk about in a little bit, aspergillus, 85% of people who got an aspergillus infection died because of that infection, not because of their underlying condition. So these opportunistic fungal infections in our already compromised patients are super dangerous. Again, we see, you know, we have high risk patients. A lot of them don't develop a candida infection, but some of them do. Anywhere from five to 10%, uh, or five to 10 people who are admitted to the hospital out of every 1,000. Um, they account for any number of bloodstream infections. And again, what we're looking at here is that all of these people who were hospitalized, 39% of them um, who got candida, right? 39% of patients who got candida left the hospital and survived. 12% of patients who got candida didn't die of the candida, but died from their underlying condition. But almost 50% of the patients who got candida died from the candida. 
their underlying condition did not kill them. It was the fungal infection that did. So again, very, very, very important to monitor your patients for potentially these opportunistic fungal infections. So those of you who um, have had children or are planning to have children, one manifestation of candidiasis that we can see in newborns and infants is called thrush. It's a fungal overgrowth in the mouth. When we see it in older patients, that is a really big sign that that patient might be immune compromised for whatever reason. Adults, older children and adults shouldn't develop thrush, um, but can. So that's a type of oral pharyngeal infection. Um, oftentimes when uh, people talk about they have a yeast infection, it's generally a candida infection. Um, and we see this uh, as like often a vaginal infection in patients who have taken antibiotics that can wipe out the normal microbiome and allow the candida to overgrow. But again, there are other uh, risk factors that can predispose a patient to these types of infections. Um, again, other parts of the body can also get infected, but it gets really rare to see these types of like endocarditis, um, CNS infection. Most commonly it's going to be oropharyngeal infection or um, vul vulvovaginal infection. Again, ocular, bone and joint, blood, not terribly common. Canada infections, you can culture them. They're relatively easy to culture. They're not super dangerous to culture. Um, you can do microscopy and look for the yeast or the hyphae and pseudohyphae. Um, if it's important to you, you can do proteomics to identify them to species, but often just like it's candida and whether or not it's drug resistant is what's more important. You can prevent it through the avoidance of broad spectrum antibiotics, because remember those antibiotics can wipe out the normal bacteria that should be there and allow the fungus to overgrow. Um, be very, very meticulous with inserting catheters, um, and any sort of blood, um, like ports or, or um, any sort of bloodline devices and to have really strong infection control procedures in clinical settings. So that's a lot of the information from your textbook. But the last thing I want to talk about with Candida is not from your textbook because it's relatively new. It's a species of Candida called Candida auris. I mean, it's caused, called that because it was first identified in the ear canal of an elderly patient in Japan um, in 2009. Um, by 2013, it was identified in the U.S. And why do I talk about it? Well, because it is highly antifungal resistant. This infection is hard to treat. It is also difficult to diagnose. It's hard to tell the difference clinically between the different species of Candida. So you're like, ooh, Candida infection. Let me prescribe drug X, like fluconazole. Oh, well, actually, Candida R is, is fluconazole resistant. Good luck. And it tends to spread through healthcare facilities with a relatively high mortality rate. So... I'm not going to make you do the math, um, but just trust me, Canada auris has been diagnosed in um, more than half of the states. You can see kind of as you go orange to red, uh, that's more and more cases per year. So this was the data from last year. There were um, nearly 2,400 patients who were identified because they had clinical symptoms. Uh, 58 or so hundred that were screened uh, that, that had it, maybe as part of their skin microbiome, genital microbiome, as, as just something that they're carrying. Worldwide, it has, again, um, infiltrated a number of different countries. Um, when the country has hash marks, like South Africa over here, um, India, what that means is that a patient from the U.S. is thought to have acquired the infection in one of these countries. So where did it come from? 
eh, best estimate global warming so global warming is responsible for um, changing the ambient temperatures which selects fungi that can reproduce at higher temperatures and guess who are higher temperatures that would be us so best best guess is that um, Canada auris was previously a plant saprophyte that gained thermo and salinity tolerance, which means it can grow in people um, because of the effects of climate change on wetlands, may have been transported by birds um, from rural to human areas, things like farming allow for interspecies transmission, and then human migration towards urban centers eventually got it into a healthcare environment. So again, this is why we make you take classes like ecology. Where do diseases come from? It's important that you understand. I had just read this headline like over the weekend, the biggest outbreaks in the US of Canada Auris are in Southern Nevada, in Vegas. Um, and they're associated with uh, healthcare down there in, in Southern Vegas. Uh, in Southern Nevada. So if you go to Vegas, try not to go to the hospital because there are literally hundreds of people right now in Southern Nevada who have this fungal infection. I love to show you this when I have it. Um, drug resistant Canada species are included in the CDC um, threat document. In 2017, it was estimated that there were almost 35,000 patients hospitalized with a drug-resistant candida infection, leading to approximately 1,700 deaths. So candida auris, you see right here, the data from 2018, there were 323 clinical cases. 2022, we're up to almost 3,000 clinical cases. So in four years, almost a tenfold increase. Um, this is considered an urgent threat. This organism was not even in the previous iteration of this CDC document. That's how new it is and how dangerous it is. It just jumped in. 90% of isolates are resistant to at least one antifungal, and that generally means class of antifungal. 30% are resistant to at least two. So this is getting to be very dangerous. 